learning towards a transformative experience, the potential that we have is oftentimes limited in our minds. And Torah gives us a perspective about ourselves that is not just freeing, but it's, you know, wow, I didn't realize that I could accomplish all that. And the definition of accomplish is also oftentimes different than any society. What are you working on? Everyone's working on something, you know? Some people are working on a career. They're, they're, they're trying to get their first million under their belt. Other people are working on, you know, an education or something like this so that they can eventually start their career. Other people, they're in the dating scene. They're working on the dating thing, you know? Other people, it's marriage or it's parenting. It's, it's endless, the things that there are to work on while in the toil in while we're in this world, you know? The question is, what is something that, that's challenging you personally? Like, on the surface, it'd be, it'd be my career, but it's really more about, like, how I spend my time. Like, I'm really struggling with that. Got it. Okay. Um, like, naps and lunches. No, those are good things. <laughs> you want more those of good things. <laughs> <laughs> those are things I want more of. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I guess, and, and my, my, my and my question is: You say Torah is a tr is transformative. Is it is it? Are we transforming, or is it or is it text transforming, or is it both? The the text is is the is the uh, you know is non moving because what that's what I that's what I thought. Plus that moves. Huh? It, that's what I thought. Plus, but it's stable and sturdy. That's, so that's what I initially thought. There are multiple layers and understandings of it. That's what it is. That's what it is. When, when you reread it again, and when, when you change, then, then, then the text changed. Yeah. Tiddish is uh, like a new idea. When you see something that you didn't see before. And there's a chazal that says, I, I think it's each person is mechuyiv, I think, to mechadish a piece of Torah in his lifetime. Meaning, on surface level, one might think that that means that, okay, we've got thousands of years of sages, plenty of ink has been spilled. There's been how many books that you could fill up houses and houses and houses, like the whole Harvard mm -hmm. Library filled with all the books that were ever written. So now I, J.P. Katz, have to come up with a new piece of Torah that wasn't written before, like an understanding and a different angle of light, whatever it is. He says, no, no, no. The Chiddush is not an object, it's not a uh, objective Chiddush. It's a subjective Chiddush. It's a Chiddush by you. That's where the Chiddush is. So when you're learning, when you mechadish a piece of Torah, it's, 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 it's something that you see today that you nice. did yesterday, which means, nice. they say, there's another Chazal that says that every 101st time seeing a piece of Torah, like a Gemara, or a Halach, whatever it is, or Chumash, is not the same as the 100th time. And so, meaning that the 101st time, you'll see something new that you didn't see last time. The idea is to constantly review, and as, that's the process of learning Gemara, is refining it finding it almost like a musician where each time they play it they see this other element of expression this new appreciation that they didn't have before when we learn torah it, literally you see nuances in the language that you didn't notice before and then you delve into it and you see ah, oh, there's a whole world in there you know so the concept of chiddush is not a an objective it's a subjective concept to to see something new to something to become a new, it's today's Rosh Chodesh, actually. So mm. the concept by Rosh Chodesh is similar, that each month we renew, the moon is renewing, it wanes and then it waxes. And, um, and we're at that point where that little sliver just showed. So we're now on the, on the rise, so to speak, more light. Mm. Growth. So we too, every Rosh Chodesh, and uh, we, we, we have to invigorate ourselves to, you know, to invent, reinvent, if you will, reinvent ourselves and to find new pieces of ourselves to, to express in the world. Um, okay, should we move on to like my specific? Yeah, let's get into it. So you think time management is, 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 a, is something you're working on? Why do I do the things that I, I do kind of thing? Like every day at work? Like holistic, everything. What should I be doing in order to achieve my goals? What are your goals? It's a good question. Complicated question, you know? Yeah. A lot of times we just don't want to work. So we'll go from job to job to job and be like, that looks great, uh, but it's not really once I'm doing it every day. That looks great, but uh, it's not really what I thought it was. It yeah. Like, you know, yeah. And so, you know, that's sort of like the 20s and persons in their 20s. They're like, 
they're like really in a, in a journey of self-discovery, trying to put those pieces together, mm. trying to see how the whole picture fits and is going to work for them, trying to find that happiness and fulfillment in life, even though there's, there is mundane in the world. And not everything is like neither a rock, sh a rock concert, nor a ballet, nor, you know, an influx of Kedushian holiness. Like there, there, are, there are aspects of the day that seem very mundane. So how do we, how do we put all that together, you know, and find purpose and meaning in our lives and enjoy as much of it as we can, you know? That's, I, think that's, I think that's a real challenge, you know? But he's right. That Torah provides a framework in which to look at the world. What we do is we create nature. And a lot of it is through momentum. It's inertia more than decision. You, you're with me or you, you're taking notes or you're, uh, oh, you are, okay. <laughs> you never know, a guy starts like looking at his phone or typing or something, you don't know what he's doing, right? So a, a, lot of, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of nature, which we create in our minds is a factor of inertia versus active decision-making. And Wait, say that, say that again. a lot of nature, which we create in our minds, is a factor of inertia versus active decision making. Meaning, meaning that we look at the world based on our experience and knowledge. Our experience and our knowledge sort of tell us how to view the world around us. For example, if I told you that if you don't get up out of your seat right now, you're going to fall 50 stories to your death, you're going to be like, JP, you're crazy. I'm sitting in my seat. I've been sitting in my seat every day. I'm not going to fall 30 stories to my death by sitting in a seat, right? I'm, I'm just, you know, it's pretty solid. I can, I, can, I, can, I can hit my chair and, you know, I can like bang my chair. I, it's here. I know it's here. It's, this is my understanding of nature, you know? and the table that this computer rests on, you know? So it's pretty solid, you know? So my experience and my knowledge tell me it's real, it's here. But what if there were aspects of the world around us that were not real, that they were literally figments of our imagination that sometimes experience corroborated to be true, but didn't make it necessarily true? in the sense that there are walls which hold me back from hitting my potential, that I can actually walk through and break out of nature. What I mean by that, is the best example I have, especially in a digital age of social media, is interacting with people in social environments, you know? Children, they have no inhibitions. That's the, that's the secret to Simcha. For them you know is that they just have no inhibitions you know it's like it's all good they don't feel like judged and they don't feel you know they don't feel that constraint called inhibition you know and so socially when we don't interact a lot and when we're, we're just constantly consuming consuming but we're not really participating so then we get into a, a, a situation where it's required to participate you know you can't just go to a party in a social situation and just like sit there and watch it <laughs> It's like people, then suddenly there's like a pressure the other way. Like, wait, I'm just sitting here watching the social situation. I'm not really participating. I must look like a, a loser or some, or some anti-social person. And I don't want to. So now I feel pressure the other way. So then I got to sort of like push myself out of the chair, so to speak, and, and jump in, you know? So that, that, the, the, um, that through experience, I can walk through a wall and I say, oh, that wall didn't really exist. Right. As I experience the world and I walk through those walls of nature, I can I can see and through trial and error which ones exist and which ones don't. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's just in the social realm of like, you know, interacting in a social situation. But in, in, in an actual reality of our situation, I am a white Caucasian male who grew up in a, you know, a semi affluent uh, neighborhood who went and earned his college degree and now has a job that he's somewhat satisfied with because there's a paycheck at the end of every week. And that's my situation right now, you know? So then it's like, okay, well, how much of that is through inertia and how much of that is through design? 
did I actively design my world or did I just sort of keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing according to the natural world around me, trying to read the natural signs around me and, 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 and receiving the influence from the people who raised me and the people who formed me, including my professors, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so I have to, I have to call time out to identify what those natural walls are before I can determine whether or not they are actually there. That's the crazy part of it, is that in order to really identify the walls, when I'm in the middle of the forest, I'm in the thick of the trees, I really need to step back out of the trees to take a deep breath and look at the path that I traveled and identify how I ended up in this place, in this chair. Does that make sense? I think it's really valuable, JP. I think you said it really well. Yeah. Well, they, you know, I've been working with young professionals for over a decade now. I see, I see pain. I see a lot of people. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's like, there's, there's a timeline, right? And there's, there are certain bumps in these roads. I see people like hit the bumps around the same time. I see, I watch our students, our friends, I watch them go through that process. And as they're going through the process, there's this, there's this initial like, Rabbi, I don't have time, I'm crushing it, you know? And then there's like, sort of it sets in, like, wait, this is my rest of my life. Like, what's going on? And, and then there's like, this is just like, everyone's going through that. Sometimes it's enough just to know that everyone's going through that together, you know? But no one's talking about it because everyone's crushing it. We all have to put on our facade. You know, we all put on that face, like, you know, and no, no one wants to admit the reality that we're in. I, I have no problem in it. Well, I that's why that's why we're zooming right now. You know? <laughs> we're zooming right now. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who, if they would watch this, they would be like, "Wow, oh, Rabbi Katz is really he's right on, he's spot on." That's exactly what I'm going through because that's the normal, that's the normal trajectory. You know, there are people who, you know, from right from an early age, they know what they want, they know what they they have a dream to be an astronaut or whatever the heck it is, and then they go after it. That's it. But most people, I think, are not like that. Yeah. Well, you said something that really hit the nail on the head is, is how much of my life is by design, how much of it is by inertia. And that's something that, that's something that like, I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and I want to take, I want to take that aspect of my life that's, that's by inertia and then make it by, by design. Right. So let's say like, let's say like 80% of my life right now is by inertia, 25% is by design. I want to flip, flip those numbers. Right. So that's that's what I'm trying. That's 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 like the the, the heart of my right. What I'm thinking. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So I think there are different aspects of that. Um, part of it is a self discovery. What are my strengths and weaknesses? What are my interests? What do I enjoy the most? You know, a lot of people don't even stop to ask those questions. I have yeah. a workshop. I have a workshop that helps people identify um, who they are and what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses. What are the what are the value systems that they have subconsciously set up for themselves? Mm. You know, what does it take to be successful? What does it take to be beautiful? What does it take? What are, what are all those, you know, things that mm. we're running after that we, we have a whole life that we built on a foundation that may need re, you know, reconstruction even. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like what, what is, um, what is um, our definition of success? Is it attainable? Or are we setting ourselves up for failure? Yeah. 99.99% of Americans are failures. Then let's not do that. I'm not saying don't be American, but let's not subscribe to what Business Insider tells us or with, or with what Vanity Fair tells us or with what, you know, let's not just subscribe to someone else's perspective without consciously and actively designing our own first. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the challenge. I think that we need that we need to we need to address is to really identify two things. Number one, who are you? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What do you, what do you enjoy? What do you despise? What are you good at? You know. And then the second one is what's your value system? You know, like what is successful? What would the forty year projection? You know, what would be the successful life for you? Mm. To have sacrificed forty years of family of community in order to get your $20 million, 
Is that success or will you regret that? You know, what's going to be success in 20 years from now, in 40 years from now? You know, just have that, that that's all value system. You know, that's not like being inspired by um, some, some uh, career course or something, you know? It's not being inspired to work harder by your professors who just want you to donate to, to the next uh, business building, you know? They're universities. They're in, the, they're in the business of endowments. They want you to go make money. Happiness is not top of the priority, you know? Fulfillment in life is not top of the priority. Moral and ethics are unfortunately not on the top of the list at business schools, mm-hmm. right? So... You know, I, th- I think that's two, a two-part move here. One is, um, who are you? And number two is, what is your value system? Yeah. Nice. So how do you, how do you address those two questions? Um, I mean... Because again, just, I just wanted just to bring it back to your original question. Yeah. If a guy is not happy and fulfilled with his daily activities and responsibilities, he probably will not do them. He will look for any excuse to procrastinate. Mm -hmm. You know what's procrastination? What? Procrastination is a mixed up formula, right? Um, In school, we would procrastinate rather than study for the test. If a person thinks that the grade that they're going to get on their test equals their value, then they will find any excuse not to give it all they got. Mm. Because if you can insert, I didn't try so hard, therefore I'm not an F, you save your ego. Mm. So my effort plus I didn't try so hard equals F, but if my effort equals F, right, now I am an F. Yeah. But if I can, inj- if I can inject a different variable, I can blame the variable. Well, I didn't try so hard. So, so the subconsciously, we, try, we come up with excuses. We come up with things to distract ourselves so that we can say we didn't try so hard. But maybe we can fail. Maybe that's the easier solution. I don't mind failing. I tried, I failed. It's, I, that doesn't make me an F. I'm not an F, you know, A for effort. That's a great thing. You know, people think that's like the, oh, well, you get a, he gets an A for effort. No, that's it. You're an A, you tried, you identified something, you know, you went after it, you gave it all you got, you failed, but you got an A. Doesn't make, a failing doesn't make you a failure. Mm-hmm. Right, baritone is beautiful. Mom is gold, gold, gold. Mm-hmm. A failing doesn't make you a failure. When you have, when everything's aligned, when you have like a job that you love, you're feeling fulfilled, it's within your ethical framework, right? Now you know you have a purpose every day to wake up and you see yourself as part of a bigger picture. You're on fire. You're on fire. You can have ups and downs, but you're, for the most part, you live in the, that's living the dream. Mm. You know, the guy who's like, <laughs> A lot of people, they put on the facade. Oh, living the dream. Living the dream. What's your dream? Yeah. Tell me, what's your dream? I always ask people, like, what do you mean by that? Like, what is the dream you're living right now? Tell me one aspect of your life right now why you're living the dream, you know? Mm. Like, come on. Come on. Why are you living the dream, buddy? Drill down on that next time someone says, oh, I'm living the dream. Why? Tell me why. why. Well, what's so great about your life? What, what, what is it? Which aspect are you referring to? Tell me. I want to get to know you a little bit. <laughs> that's that's funny. I was actually one of my friends in Australia. Uh, the guy I went to his wedding. He's like, like he's like, he's living the 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 dream. Like you know, he's he was you know, he, he's he just got married. Um, he has a a great job that he can work from from home and flexible and everything and, and um he he lives in a beautiful beach town with his friends but he's still like he's told me that he's still like struggling with things and it's like of course 
Like he was like, he, he's like, he's like, he's like, I'm worried that my life is getting too mon- like monotonous. Hmm. And people just look for things to struggle with, no matter how, how high up the ladder you go. True. And people, people think that it's going to be one way. And then they find, once they get there, they're like, well, this isn't necessary. Look, it's better to, re- it's better that he hit that point at 20 something than at 60 something, right? Imagine dedicating all your life to getting that dream. And then you find out it's actually a nightmare or it's just not the dream you thought it was, you know? Yeah. I, I, th- I think it's a, a reflection of his value systems, you know? Well, but that's a great life. But like, is that all that it is? I think, I, I think it's more like, I think more like happiness comes from the, the, the struggle, right? If you, that's interesting. That's interesting. But, I, you know, it depends on the context of struggle, I think. Yeah. I, yeah. Right. Right. That's right. Like, no one, you see, you no see one people, wants to struggle with something that's not worth it. You see, right. You see people like, like, you know, Jeff Bezos, Tom Brady, Warren Buffett, they're like the, the top of the, the top of their, their field, the top of their game. Yeah. But they're still working every day. We're the team. They're working so hard. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they don't have to. But they, they, they choose to. Well, they love, they love the sport or they, they love their ego, whatever it's it is. Not, I think it's more than that. I think, I think they just, they just want something. They want someone to struggle with. They want to, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think if, the, if the, it, it depends why we're struggling, you know? It depends why we're struggling. Mm, that's, that's a good one. question. That's a good, that's a good question. That's the value system. Yeah. That's the value system. You know, an, Olympic, yeah. an Olympian may love gymnastics, but that's not a reason to become number one in the world, right? You can just play gymnastics. If you can just have a great time on the bars, call it a day. Why are you <laughs> number one? You love the sport? Come on. Who are you kidding? You love the sport? It's a great question. No, the, the, person, the person has to become number one has to become number one. I always get nervous around someone who must be number one. Okay. And I'm, I'm buckling my seatbelt. Okay, we're going to succeed. We're going to be ambitious. We're going to really put in some effort. But on the other hand, if we don't win, we're losers. Mm-hmm. I reject that philosophy. That's not a part of my mantra. That's not a part of my, any part of my being. If I lose, I am not a loser. If I fail, I'm not a failure. If I tried my best and I'm doing something that I believe in, then that's an A plus in my book. Yeah. I think that when, a, when, I'm, when I'm in the company of someone who must be the best, oftentimes, this, you'll, you'll notice this, the type A personality that has to be the best will put people around them down. This, this father, he left and, then, and one of the, the shorter, older brother, um, he dug a hole to put his younger, taller brother into. And when the father came home, the father was very disappointed. He's like, what is this? He says, look, I'm taller than my brother. So he says, he says, if you wanted to be taller than your brother, you should have dug a mound to stand on. Why did you dig a hole and put your brother in it? You could have dug a mound and stood on it. You would be taller than your brother. And it's the same effort. The guy, Mamush, dug a big hole, put all the dirt in another spot, right? So when people are in a win-lose paradigm, I'm always on guard. You know, a lot of times it comes with, you know, the shtach. It comes with like knocking, knocking people down, you know, and we all do it. We all do it at times. We all have to work on it. But I think the, win, the win-lose paradigm is comparative Judaism or it's comparative economics, right? It, it, you name it, comparative physical health or physical beauty, comparative image in, in the community or, you know, what does it look like? What does my family look like compared to that person's family? It never ends. It never ends. And it all stems from insecurity. The more we can moshlim ourselves, the more we can complete ourselves and recognize our true potential, the closer we can get to, a, a, to removing these, these like really um, unnecessary pain pressure points in our lives that push us. They like push us in all the different directions, you know? And so that's part of back to that nature thing where we create these natural barriers based on the environment we grew up in. We grew up in America. America is very much a, you know, our whole childhood is spent sports. You know, how much of the sport were parents and coaches telling us to go shake the other person's hand and say, good game. Like to me, it was always like this like sort of conciliatory thing at the end. 
It wasn't the main picture. The main thing wasn't going to say, hey, great job. Hey, you did a great job, man. Good job on that, encouraging your friends, you know? No, it was Mamish like growing up, that was the whole idea was to bury the other person, you know? <laughs> it was to literally win at all costs. Like, and then we're winners, you know? Then we identify with that, you know? To the point we buy the hats and we put on the jackets, and we, you know, get, get all the garb, these like number one things, you know, with the logos and everything. We identify with that. We're the best, you know? We try to become the best. But at whose expense? How much of it is good? How many times do you see it after a, a, a you know a sporting event? People are like, hey, good game. Other team, you guys did a great job, you know. But it's in our imagination, it's all shtus. It's it's all kolach demyon. It's not Hashem's world. That's not what Hashem had in mind. It's a misplaced. It's a misplaced um, striving. Uh, it's something to think about, you know. So yeah. what? So that's the question. Is what are, who are you, and what is your value system? That's what we're going to try and really get into. Yes. That's the idea. Beautiful. Nice. Thanks, Rabbi.